You're listening to Tone Benders, the Sound Designers Podcast. Let's do this. Hey, everybody, welcome to Tone Benders. My name is Tim, and I will be your host for today. Today, we are talking about the sound of the Mandalorian. The Disney Plus series has had the internet buzzing for the last few months because of its ultra high production values. The sound on the show is no exception. Introducing some of the coolest sounds in the long history of the Star Wars franchise, the Mandalorian is a sonic wonder. Joining us today are supervising sound editor David Accord. Dave has worked on just about every Star Wars project in the last little while, including series, films, and games. He is also busy in the animated world, overseeing 2018's The Grinch and The Secret Life of Pets 1 and 2. He's also dipped his toe in the Marvel Universe, having sound supervised Guardians of the Galaxies 2, as well as mixed the last few P.T. Anderson films. Wow, that's quite a CV. Welcome to the show, Dave. Hi, thank you very much. Also joining us is Bonnie Wilde, the series re-recording mixer on The Mandalorian. Bonnie has worked on lots of past Star Wars projects, including the Rebels animated series, The Last Jedi, and Solo. She also mixed Captain Marvel. Welcome to the show, Bonnie. Hey, nice to meet you, Timothy. So let's start talking about season two. But first, you were both on season one, correct? That's right. Correct, yeah. Did you notice anything different in season two from season one, or was it just continuing the same journey? I think it was quite different. It felt quite different. We had a lot of things already established, which helps with the process. Everyone had already done it once, again, helps with the process. So I feel like season two, we kind of just picked up the rhythm we'd got into by the end of season one, which did feel really good. I mean, we had a very different workflow, obviously, as well for season two, because we were all at home. We were, like, (laughs) (laughs) mid-quarantine. But actually, everyone was kind of in really high spirits, I think, straight. Like, strangely, it was was very enjoyable. It was really good. Season one of Mando was the first uh, live-action show from Lucasfilm since uh, Young Indy, right? So... I mean, we had done Clone Wars and Rebels and Resistance and Star Wars uh, Galaxies of Adventure. We had other animated shows, but we hadn't done anything of this scale uh, up to this point. So like like Bonnie was indicating, um, there was in season one, there was a lot of uh, methods of operation to sort of hammer out that weren't uh, stumbling blocks um, in season two. Had you started work on season two when the lockdown started last March? We didn't do anything before March, right? I think I might have sent over... A handful of sound effects, but before them, not really. I don't think we really got into it until like May. No, we we went in late this time. Yeah, we we went in like hard, fast. <laughs> <laughs> we went really close to the mixes this time, so that we were just like as up to date with everything that was coming out of the picture department as possible. Season one, we attempted like a different workflow, which in theory was going to be amazing and work. We couldn't all really keep up with each other, I think. We started much earlier, which felt nice. But then by the time you get to mix, you, there's just a lot of conforming and, and catching up that, that's kind of going on. And so this time we went the other way and, and it really worked. It really worked, actually. I think it was successful. I mean, we, we did it. Which I think <laughs> Anything that gets completed in 2020 is successful. <laughs> yeah, we mixed at the ranch, but it was only me in the room. And then, you know, everyone was remote. What is good about doing a streaming show like that is that you're not like heavily concerned with the fact that people are listening on headphones because you're kind of replicating the environment to to a certain extent. So everyone's hearing your stereo down mix and no one's asking the question, is this really what it's going to sound like when it goes out? Because it is. That is your, you know, we, we, you know, I'm mixing to spec, you know, for a start and then everyone's hearing it in a stereo headphone environment and you kind of eliminate a lot of those questions so even that was fine you know every every, we had like standard everyone kind of had standard headphones we made sure everyone was as close to listening the same as possible it was good I think I mean that I think that was actually kind of a bonus (laughs) (laughs) no one in the room bothering you either eh? you got to just do some work I mean even in season one John Favreau was pretty keen on us monitoring through headphones or on a laptop or something, at least as a mastering pass to kind of make sure everything's, you know, because a lot of people are going to watch it that way. 
There's been lots of discussion about the visual technology used in The Mandalorian for scenes that are shot in what is called the volume. It's a soundstage featuring virtual backgrounds that are present while they're shooting with these high-res screens surrounding the cast during production. With so much of the CG work already present from the very start, how does that affect the audio post workflow? When you get the turnover, they're in the environment, which is amazing. When I was cutting season one, it's like, well, my first pass is going to be to go through and cut cut all the backgrounds and everything is there it it all exists I mean they can just go anywhere as well it, it's really amazing <laughs> I mean there's you know you're still getting you know like visual effects obviously that keep coming and, and keep coming but the environment is there that's definitely a bonus and it's kind of etched in stone they can't change their mind you know it's in camera it's there so there's no all of a sudden we're going to be on a sandy planet and not a snowy planet so that's great. <laughs> so season two features a lot of other Mandalorians other than just the title character. And these Mandalorians, although they do take their helmets off, they, they're under helmets a lot of the time. So is all that just ADR? Was anything recorded on set that's usable? Or They actually used a lot of in-helmet this year. Uh, last season, most of Mando was looped. we ADR'd. Yeah. Uh, but this season, certainly like Bo-Katan, we used a lot of her dialogue from in her helmet. I think she was tricky. She had an air conditioner, I think, in there. I don't think Mando gets an egg. He doesn't get <laughs> Pedro doesn't get an air conditioner. <laughs> um, but yeah, we, we salvaged quite a lot of it this year. Um, and they want to go with it for, you know, for performance. So we do. And we're like, well, it's if it's noisy, it doesn't matter too much. We're going to futz it anyway. But then there's matching. Like, I do have to match... It's this weird thing of like matching futz then. It's like, well, this, it wasn't impossible. If you can't tell, then I'm going to take it as being successful. <laughs> Very successful, yeah. I just want to ask a question about a scene that got lots of people in the sound world talking. The scene between Ashoka with her lightsabers and the warden with her Beskar spear. The sound was super cool in that. And it really helped tell the story because part of the battle is happening completely off screen behind a wall. But then you cut to it, and there's really cool, interesting sounds. And I'm wondering if we could just talk about the uh, the sounds that you used and how you went about mixing that, because that whole scene, I feel like we could have this whole conversation about that scene. It was super fun to listen to and watch, obviously. So this is a Dave Filoni-directed episode. Dave had called and said, this is what we want to do for this sequence here. And we've got, uh, you know, Beskar staff versus lightsaber, which isn't something that we've done before or heard before and, and Dave wanted to have this new sound so when, when the when the the two weapons clash that it doesn't sound like a lightsaber lightsabers clashing it doesn't sound like swords it sounds like something totally new but also kind of musical and this was going to relate a little bit to the bell too there's the the bell in the town square that sort of alarm bell the whole episode has this sort of rhyming you know, melody sort of thing that happens with the uh, chimey type sounds throughout the the episode. There's also the the swinging lanterns in the in the alley. Um, what we ended up doing was we, we, there was a bit of back and forth uh, between uh, the sound department, and picture department, and Dave to sort of zero in on what we wanted these things to sound like. And I had these recordings uh, that I'd made some in Bangkok. There's these um, this place called the Gold Mount, which has all these chimes and bells and these things that I recorded a bunch of them um, when I was there. And also when I was in, in China a few years ago in Wuhan, um, there's an old temple there and it has a really cool bell sound there too. So I was kind of gathering all of my really cool bell sounds and I ended up using almost all of them between the, the town bell and the saber clashes. And we, we kind of landed on what we thought was a nice rhyming thing between the, the different sounds in the town sent those off to picture department they cut those in the picture and then we kind of refined that as we went the idea of the off-screen sword fight happening while we're with mando um, and lang was dave's idea you could kind of almost sort of tell and then towards the end you can tell who won the fight you know they they know it and the audience knows it without seeing it and that that was that that's all dave filoni i always love it when sound is telling a story without anyone really realizing it. And a way that the Beskar spear tells an interesting extra bit of storytelling is that in that episode with Ahsoka fighting, 
it's a very elegant sounding spear. The, the way it's shot, uh, the woman who's controlling it is uh, doing very smooth movements and you're getting these crisp, clear kind of bell uh, tones. Mm-hmm. But then when Mando has to use it to fight in uh, an episode, a couple of episodes later, that, that elegance is gone. It's out the window. He's mm-hmm. just trying to hold on for dear life. And it, both visually, it's not elegant. It's, it's a rough and dirty fight. But the sound reinforces that he does not know how to use the spear correctly. He's just holding on for dear life. And I thought that was a really nice, well, maybe not callback because you didn't call back to those sounds, but choice right. not to repeat those sounds in that scene. Like what was so nice about the Ahsoka moment is like we had this kind of stillness. You know, kind of this kind kind of came out of this stillness in the courtyard there. And then you have it kind of echoing around. And it is, it, you're right, it, it is very graceful and deliberate. And I even felt like that mixing that, you know, I'm talking to Dave about mixing that and how it felt so like, you know, when you mix things like that, you have, you feel like you have nothing to like hide behind. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's like everything is just there. Every sound is there and every like it's the way you you treat every sound you think about everything you consider everything that was definitely one of the episodes i was most nervous about as well because i felt like i can really ruin i can really ruin this <laughs> <laughs> you know if you if you do it wrong and try it and at that point make it like i'm going to mix it like this like it's not going to it's not going to work you have to just like put aside everything and just listen to everything and consider consider everything that's going on and you you are just dealing with the story there you're supporting all the story and the action and the emotion and it's it's carrying everything so you know and even when it's off screen it's it's the same thing and it's like finding that balance of dealing with the two stories then you know you're you're dealing with the standoff outside in the street with mando and and you're still dealing with the the story of the fight in the courtyard that was a really delicate balance you know as opposed to when we're yeah in the ship in episode eight it's way more like <laughs> right right the magistrate <laughs> fight with with ahsoka that whole that whole episode that's dave's kind of love letter to um kurosawa Dave's a huge Kurosawa fan. I think that episode was his way of giving a nod to to that, and and by bringing Ahsoka back into the fold too, with that sensibility, the original Clone Wars cartoon. I think Dave always was trying to reference Kurosawa, and maybe not every episode, but I think that was always Dave's big influence as well. So it, she brought that sensibility with her. I think when she came back to the show. The Mandalorian was devoid of lightsabers for a long time. And when Ahsoka shows up and just the first time she lights up that lightsaber, there's something about the sound and you guys took a little bit of a tweak to it, but the sound of the lightsaber that makes my heart jump with joy, you know, like I, it's completely involuntary. I'm watching the show. That one, it's on one of the first shots of the episode, but like, I was just like in my chair, ready, comfy to go. And then, Oh, Leaning in, the lightsabers out. Here we go, here we go. So how did you go right. about tackling the lightsabers? Actually, a sound effect that we originated on Rebels, the animated show. Love those lightsabers. Right, right. And that's Ahsoka shows up. Yeah. Um, uh, adult Ahsoka shows up on Rebels, and she's got these new lightsabers, these white lightsabers. And um, so Dave Floney wanted something new. So I made these, these kind of new, cleaner-sounding lightsabers they don't have your traditional hum or buzz or rattle or anything they're they just sound a little more um i don't know to me they just sound a little more elegant <laughs> and so for for mandalorian we we started with those sound effects as like a, a launching point and um gave them a little extra um beef and a few extra flourishes and sound effects to kind of uh, make them live in the live action world a little bit better. I love those lightsabers. They're like, I think they're my favorite. They're, my, I probably, you know, they're amazing. I love them. <laughs> well, they are. They are so distinct and unique sounding. They're fun. They're great. Yeah. Love them. They are fun. And that when she just comes in, it's right like across camera. It's like yes. <laughs> Remember Filoni asking, so what do you think about like? the opening it's like she's just like we don't have to wait for her she's just like Ugh. <laughs> she's just like there yes <laughs> that's the best part of that episode is like you don't have to wait around for it right? it's like right off the bat yeah. like here you go i love that 
Yeah. Bonnie, what was your favorite scene to mix for season two? I had like particular different favorites for particular different things. Do you know what I mean? So I did love the crate dragon. Like I felt like a personal triumph <laughs> because I managed to deal with like monsters yelling, music, like jetpacks and everything and like figure out how to make that work. So from like a, an achievement as like dealing with stuff, when I had like finally managed to mix that uh, down, down there, I was like, okay, that's, I feel good about that. Like that's a, it was just satisfying from like a, a human achievement level. And um, <laughs> as it should be, that was, that was yeah. a lot going on. That was an impressive yeah. episode. Honestly, all of them in three, in uh, when Bo-Katan, Shows up. I love Ludwig's music when they show up, and it's just like you just hit a rave. You know, obviously we're in quarantine as well, so like any amount of fun that can be had is going to be had. <laughs> and I'm on, my, oh, you know, I'm just on my own at work, and that showed up. There was some heavy dance moves involved when when we got there, because it just it just like kicks. You're just like, oh, this is cool. <laughs> I did. I loved that. That was a lot of fun. And then they have that, that punch up on the ship. Plus, we're in the water. I, I did something about Star Wars as well and being in the water that's always like novel. You gotta love yeah. that. And those pirates, man, the, the, the loot group for those pirates, actually. I really like that. <laughs> <laughs> and they're all, and five. I generally, I love mixing five and all the different environments that are in Filoni's episode. You know, we're in the the forest and having the the contrast he wanted the contrast between like the life of the town and like the forest that has basically been destroyed but then areas of it that kind of Ahsoka is like bringing life back to by being there little Grogu when he gets his name said it's so, <laughs> it's so cute and then eight was its you know the finale was its own thing and that had its own like triumphs and nerves that really felt like, you know, mixing a couple of reels of a big feature by the time we got down there. There's just, you know, you know, I love my job, so I'll go on about all the different bits of it. <laughs> I love this. I love this. <laughs> That's great to hear because there's a lot of people in this world that don't love their jobs. So it's always great to hear that. <laughs> so you brought up the, the last episode. Uh, Dave, do you want to talk a bit about the sound design for the Dark Troopers? Hmm. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm trying to remember what I did. <laughs> That's the thing about this this show is like there's it's just there's the sheer volume of material that you create for every season, let alone every episode. Yeah. I think they didn't want vocals on the Dark Troopers, right? That was the thing. Because I know sometimes I was like, hey, what about this when we really go to the Dark Troopers' eyes? And they're like, no, we're not having, they're not going to, they don't, they don't vocalize. Yeah. Right. Because we had made some vocals for it, and then they were like, nah, none of that. They wanted them yeah. to be silent and, um, you know, just like sort of... Terrifying. Yeah, soulless, silent things, you know, terrifying. But, um, yeah, it's just, you know, it's just a lot of heavy machinery and a lot of low end. <laughs> and Favreau wanted them really articulated. And at that point, I remember him, him saying, you know, about his process of Iron Man and kind of working through that. And then I was like, well... JR's our sound effects editor. He caught Iron Man, so this is great. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, hats off to JR uh, Grubbs yeah. who um, uh, cut sound effects on that episode. Um, yeah. I say, and, and episode five was Benny Burt. That was Benny Burt. Yeah. Benny Burt. Yeah. Ben Burt's son. Yeah. Pretty nice to uh, reach out to those level of talent to help you out on the episodes. That's amazing. Yeah. So you mentioned John Favreau. I was wondering about spotting sessions. You two have both worked on a lot of Star Wars content. You almost know more about the sound of the world than he might. I've done several Star Wars projects over the years, starting with when George was running the show, then Dave Filoni, J.J. Um, Abrams, uh, Tony Gilroy, or various people along the way that have had hands in the Star Wars universe. Everybody has their own favorite thing about Star Wars or their favorite Star Wars sound effects or what they like, but also people want to bring their own thing to it. And rightly so, because this is new, you know, uh, Mandalorian is new. We're in a different sort of zone on different planets with different people and different ships and weapons and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
John Favreau or Dave Filoni um, or, or the picture editors, uh, the episodic directors all have their own sort of idea of what this should sound like. Um, and if it's a if it's a brand new thing, you know, then obviously we're rolling with that and bring whatever is in their head into reality. And that's that's the goal. Right. But for certain things like X-Wings or, you know, you've got um, Stormtrooper guns or certain things that have uh, history, you know, R2-D2, there's that have an established sound. You're really not going to mess with that too much. And, and everybody knows that. Uh, I haven't really encountered uh, a filmmaker on these shows that wants to sort of reinvent the wheel in a way. People have sort of sort of a global sort of respect for the legacy sounds of the show because I think that that's kind of a part of the history of the franchise itself are those sound effects. So I, I think it you, you don't want to record you know new Chewbacca or something. I mean you, you want Chewbacca has a sound like in, in Force Awakens we used original Chewbacca sound effects. We didn't try and redo that. There are some some things like the Stormtrooper guns in Mandalorian that have that sort of original Ben Burt Stormtrooper sound that we've given it a little, you know, a little beef, a little extra zip to it, a little extra whatever, but it's always got rooted in that sound. I and mean, then you, you're allowed to play with things when you've got Mando's weapons or his ship or whatever, which are created from scratch. But then the kind of goal is there to have it all sort of live in that Star Wars universe, so it all has to have that sort of... Star Wars old is new kind of patina to it that all the Star Wars sounds going to have. Sometimes we'll want to like put some legacy somewhere and he always makes a good point of like well we don't want to be thinking about a moment somewhere else he's like you know sometimes it is really nice to kind of to visit that but sometimes he's like I, I don't want to be thinking about this other point I want to be really in this moment that we have like now and relevant to now He's very good at all those those decision making and yeah. so many sounds. It's so much fun. <laughs> Speaking of uh, legacy sounds, I wanted to ask you about a particular sound from Star Wars Past. In the second to last episode, Boba Fett drops a seismic bomb from Slave One. Yeah. It's a sound we have not really heard since Attack of the Clones. Yeah. What is your approach to an iconic sound like that? <laughs> like we watched episode two and said, let's do that. <laughs> yeah, let's do that. I th I, yeah, I think eventually we actually went into, we went into it. and Like the actual Pro Tool sessions from like over 20 years ago? Oh, yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of archive digging, yeah. It's kind of a one-to-one -one recreation of that event, mm. pretty much. You want to make sure you get it right as well, you know. We're always like, if we get this wrong, people are going to be mad at us. <laughs> you never hear the end of it. I know. And that's and it's the thing, again, with those legacy sounds, is you got to be very careful if you if you want to make adjustments and try anything new with it. Yeah. Uh, you don't want to ruin it, you know? I mean, and that that sound is a kind of a perfect sound it's a, or, or example of a perfect sound that you definitely don't want to mess with. So we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Just a couple other things I wanted to talk about before we let you go. The score is really awesome because this is a Star Wars story. Everyone is familiar with John Williams' scores for all the Star Wars. But this is a different Star Wars story, and it's got... It's 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 of that nature, but it's a different type of score, mm -hmm. and it also sticks in your head in a major yeah. way. Dun, 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 dun. It's always every any time I watch an episode for the next three days, it's just looping in my head. <laughs> but um, and but then it's also got uh, elements like the dark trooper theme, and where it mm -hmm. just suddenly goes super high techy bananas. <laughs> <That's>, yeah, oh. <laughs> I, I'm such a Ludwig fan. Like I can't. I, I can't cope with it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I see when that music gets delivered, I'm just like, no. And it was at this point in the interview when Bonnie's recorder dropped out of record on us without anyone noticing. So for the rest of the interview, we're going to be hearing Bonnie through the crappy Zoom feed. So it's not as good quality, but I think what she's saying is worth listening to the uh, lesser quality because she's got some good stories to tell coming up. So uh, let's continue with Bonnie in slightly reduced quality. In episode one on this, we hit the card for that. And then he just ballsy straight into like, you know, our credit music. Da, 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 da. I remember like I cried at that point. I was like, man, this is episode one. This is going to be like... <laughs> 
an adventure. He's just like, yeah, da, 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 and the rays across going across the planet and stuff. It's like, man, we're going to Tatooine. We're going. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And the tu- the Tusker Raiders, uh, everything, everything. <laughs> I live for it. You can tell as well the way I mix it. I'm just like, (laughs) (laughs) Ludwig like came to, well, you know, he zoomed into the the finale. And honestly, as a mixer, when they're like the composers coming, you're like, oh, this is where unravel. Like (laughs) (laughs) now everyone is here who, who wants everything. And, I can't possibly make everybody happy. This is when it's going to go to shit. And uh, <laughs> like Ludwig dials in. For a start, that dude is cool. Like he is extremely pleasant and knowledgeable. And he's just there like, hi, everyone. It's like, oh, man. Like when he tears, tears into me at the end of this, it's going to be heartbreaking. You know? <laughs> like he was actually happy and I was like oh and I was like he's probably happy because you can probably tell how much I enjoy his music all the way through I'm like here it comes here it comes here it comes here it comes (laughs) but it's a great and what I love about it 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 is that it's completely its own thing and he he took that and was like this is gonna be its own like character and it's going to give everything its own character. It gives Mando his character. It doesn't like throw away anything that's come before. It just like does its own thing. And it still feels like Star Wars because mm. it has the same kind of importance to everything that's going on. It has has some of those just sort of traditional old school, like heroic themes to it. Like, you know, here's the good guy, you know, here's the bad guy. You can really feel it. But he's not trying to be John Williams, and it was it was it's ballsy, and I love it for that. And I think it's some of the best music you'll hear on TV. I think it's fantastic. In uh, the arrangement, the amount of like detail he manages to get into that, in he has you know the equivalent of no time. Like we we're all kind of working on a much more compact schedule, budget, yeah. and everything, and like what he produces how did he i still i mean i i know that how he did but i still don't know how he made that score in quarantine with with the limitations that he had this time around and he kicks that out i mean come on man that's crazy talent (laughs) i'll stop talking about him now because he's amazing (laughs) so before i let you go last question as two of you have worked on star wars for so long every episode of rebels every episode of resistance every new film uh, introduces new aliens, new creatures. You two are probably the world's foremost experts on creature vocalizations <laughs> because of all the ones that you've done over the years. What is your process when you get a new creature in front of you that you've never seen before? Where do you start? Creature vocals, that's a staple of Star Wars. E- even just basic cantina one-off creatures that might just utter a couple little grunts and then move on. Everything's got to have its own little signature thing, it, you know, its own specific um, sound. So that's a that's a huge thing for Star Wars. So as far as like, where do you start? Boy, I, I, I don't even know. Like with the crate Dragon, um, for example, um, in, in spotting, when we were spotting that, uh, John Favreau uh, and Dave, they really wanted us to embrace, to really lean into the various Ben Kenobi crate dragon vocalizations that have been used in New Hope when he scares off the Tuscan Raiders. It's been done and redone over the different versions of that of that movie over the years. Um, we started off with like just as an example of how you know, we do creature vocal design. You kind of start off with something literal, you know, for me anyway, like. I want this thing to kind of be like a, you know, whatever, like a bear. So you start with a bear recording. So with, with the crate dragon, it's like, okay, here's what we're starting with. This is all we know that this thing sounds like are the th- three different versions of this sound that have been used in the movie. And, you know, you try it, pitching it down and slowing it and, you know, different, very, very, and it's, it was all like a little like, yeah, that's weird, you know, <laughs> but it wasn't quite, 
so it, it, it where we ended up was like it's kind of woven into the into the structure of that like the original um, 1977 version of it has that sort of shape to the sound like so we tried more monstrous version that uh, of that that would kind of carry that shape you know of the sound rather than having it literally be that sound you, you try different things like that animal recordings especially animal recordings recorded at you know high sample rate you can kind of pitch with with ease there's this uh sankin uh 100 uh, hertz mic do you know this this mic yeah the sankin co 100k yeah Fantastic mic as far as like um, if you're going to pitch something down, if you record that with that mic at like 192, you can pitch down and it, it's just it's amazing it, the, the sounds you can create with that. So, yeah, I, I'd recorded um, a Siberian Lynx with that mic and pitched it way down and got some good guttural growls and things for for crate. Anyway, you end up leaning on a variety of things at the end of the day. You, you, you sort of build on it and build on it and build on it. You you have like pass A and B and C and you keep adding little things and taking away little things. And that's kind of the important part, too, is to keep taking away things if you're going to add stuff or it just kind of turns into noise very quickly. Um, And then you just have that generic monster sound if you're not careful. Then there's things like the Dr. Mandible in the cantina, which is um, we started out with a lot of like. In, like clicks that were kind of meant to be like insect like clicks and buzzes and things. And ultimately, I think we ended up using um, a loop grouper that did a vocalization for that. And that's kind of a route, too, is, uh, is where I'm going with this is human vocalization can be an extremely useful tool with alien vocals, even in part. If you're just, if it's part, you know, your voice or an actor's voice mixed in with, with sound effects, um, you know, of course the old pitch and reverse or <laughs> staples in, in that area. It's always a little bit of everything. It's always trial and error, um, mostly error and uh, a lot of back and forth with picture to, to see if this is what they're after. What do we do for the HK droids in episode five? The, um, that was like a vocalization. That's kind of got this distorted pitch down, you know, nonsense words, you know, for the HK droids. That's a good example of using human voice with some some plugins to kind of get what you want. I think in general, I love the creatures. Say, for example, like episode one of this season, you know, we we open and we and we go to the Gamorian fight there. You make the world so distinct, so kind of quickly and easily with like a creature layer in there. It feel, you know, mm-hmm. you you are kind of immediately otherworldly, and it's not it's not necessarily something that your ear is drawn to or you you can recognize distinctly but it is, is you know when you're cutting and mixing as soon as you're kind of putting that that layer of creature into it it changes everything and it you know and it brings it into you know into the galaxy which is you know i love that so any anywhere we go i'm always looking for like little places to cut a creature <laughs> or walking by <laughs> I think he can have a little vocalization in there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and we are seeing a lot of creatures that we have seen before, but when they aren't even, if it's a tiny moment for shows like this, not necessarily going to get Dave to design a background character that's walking around, you know, that's crazy. <laughs> but, there, you know, there's so much material that we can go back to that isn't either prominent or, you know, a lot of stuff that isn't, that hasn't been used yet in, you know, in the library yeah. that we can that we can pull from, but, but everything has its own unique tone and you can get it in there and it's like, oh, that's fun. It's just, it's just like, you know, whatever it is, kind of just <laughs> just off. It's like, you know, creature loop group going by. Be careful with that too, because then like fans will call you out if like that's not what that sounded like and, you know, in this episode of Clone Wars or, you know, that kind of thing. Which is why when you do start, you need like Matt and Dave heavily around policing you because I'll be like, this is cool. And they'll be like, no, 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 no. <laughs> That's not what a blurg sounds like, Bunny. <laughs> <laughs> but we found that creature, the droid in, in the finale episode who's walking down the hallway. Oh, yeah. we, had a, we had a moment <laughs> there as well because we're all remote and Matt is like, Matt is trying to like mouth the sound of the droid <laughs> whilst I'm like in the library trying to find. We found it, which is a that was a quarantine miracle that I found that. <laughs> so I said, this one? Yes. 
but yeah you need you need these guys around because they literally are the best and they know all the things <laughs> <laughs> well i think you're quickly making yourself indispensable too after the work on this series so i mean that is my goal obviously <laughs> <laughs> well thanks for talking to us today i can tell in your general tone and your positivity how much joy you get out of the work that you're doing and that can be inspiring to others working in sound congratulations on the success of the mandalorian your work has played a large part in that success I hope we can have you back on the show someday because it's been really great to speak with you. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Tim. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Film Bitters is produced by Timothy Muirhead, Renee Coronado, and Teresa Morrow. Theme music is by Mark Strait. Send your emails to info at tonebenderspodcast.com. Follow us on Twitter via at the Tonebenders and join Tonebenders Podcast on Facebook. Support this podcast. You can use our links when you shop with Amazon or B&H, or leave us a tip. Just go to ToneBendersPodcast.com and click the support button. Thanks for listening. If you are interested in more pro audio related content, stay tuned to hear what other members of the Audio Podcast Alliance are releasing. To learn more and find links to other shows similar to ToneBenders, go to AudioPodcast.org. Hi, this is Michael Helms, host of the Location Sound Podcast. Recently, I spoke with production sound mixer and sound designer, Pamela Shing Berman, based out of Los Angeles, California. She talks about pivoting during COVID-19 and producing content for She Votes and also her involvement with women in audio. Check out the latest episode. I'm Dallas Taylor, host of 20,000 Hertz, a TED podcast that reveals the stories behind the world's most recognizable and interesting sounds. We've revealed the untold story about how the iconic Netflix audio logo was almost completely different. Thank God I didn't go with the goat. (laughs) And we found out that the sound designer of Game of Thrones channeled her grief into the sounds of the dragons. These dragons have kind of saved me in a way because they have become this vessel for me to work through my own pain. We've also examined the frightening implications of audio deepfakes. Being able to release fake audio or video is going to potentially be a major vector for trying to influence populations, influence votes. And we've unraveled the relationship between light, sound, and space. The whole universe is connected by light. But with sound, you really are a trillion different islands of sound. 